Children of Dune continues the exploration of the hero and society's messianic impulse, and returns to the style of the first part of the trilogy. The book concentrates more again on the systems that have grown around the following of a religious hero, although it does return to the more familiar modes of action and adventure that the story diverted from in Dune Messiah. Since Paul's disappearance into the desert, he has become a god to the people of his empire, and religion and government have fully merged in his name, and making the breaking of law a sin. His subsequent reuniting with his son and eventual death bring about another great social morphological change to the Imperium. His role in consideration of Jungian archetypes has seen him transformed through a number of these concepts, from youth to hero, syzygy to king, and ultimately hierophant to father. It now turns to Leto II to take up the mantle of the archetypal hero, and again turn it completely upon its head. His hero quest again follows much of the nature of the monomyth and Raglan's ritualistic steps, reiterating Palumbo's notion of the fractal patterns inherent within both the monomyth and the structure of the Dune series. Once again we are presented with a hero as a youth, already seen as semi-divine because of his lineage, and what initially appears to be a sympathetic protagonist. With Paul's disappearance at the end of Dune Messiah, Alia is declared regent of the Golden Lion Throne, holding it in trust for the day when Leto II comes of age. She also controls the religion of Moadib as a hierophant, a troublesome rule for her as she assumes the responsibilities of Paul but without his prescient vision. Her attempts to push this genetic ability with Melange, and the combined stresses upon her begin to slowly erode her sanity, which is crumbling under the weight of the multitude in her other memory. In a moment of weakness she turns to the personality of the Baron Harkonnen to help her, and always villainous, he seeks for revenge from beyond the grave. As such she has become a threat to the twins Leto II and Ganema, who are also threatened by a conspiracy against them by the Lady Wensisia, who seeks to place her own son Faradon upon the throne. Leto II like his father can be viewed as part of a syzygy with his twin sister Ganema as hero, but his hero quest seeking what Herbert liked to call the Pearl of Great Wisdom leads to a sudden apotheosis where the hero becomes divinity and at one and the same time, king and villain. Leto II is tested by his mother Jessica early in Children of Dune, reminiscent of Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohiam's visit to Paul with the Gom Jabbar. The test does not have the appearance of threat to Leto II as his father's testing to see if he was human, but the youth is in peril. His mother has come to determine whether he and Ganema are abominations, with Jessica already suspecting that her daughter Alia has succumbed to this state. Ganema and Leto II presently surprise their grandmother, although she is still a little suspicious. We later discover Ganema does escape the fate of abomination due to a hypnotic command that allows her to think her brother is dead. But Leto has embraced it, and accepted the help of his father within other memory to survive it. To that extent he has carefully lied and manipulated his mother, who is now representing the sisterhood's interests once more. Well and good cousin, she asked me if I were abomination. I answered in the negative. That was my first treachery. You see, Ganema escaped this, but I did not. I was forced to balance the inner lives under the pressure of excessive melange. I had to seek the active cooperation of those aroused lives within me. Doing this, I avoided the most malignant and chose a dominant helper thrust upon me by the inner awareness which was my father. I am not, in truth, my father or this helper. Then again, I am not the second Leto. It is only when it is too late that Jessica realises that both Ganema and Leto II possess the memories of a multitude of Bene Gesserit's sisters, and hence able to discern their motives and outwit them at every point. 
Towards the end of Children of Dune, we see the differences in Leto II as he is slowly changing into the God Emperor, already losing his humanity. In Seeking Out a Forbidden Siege, Jack Kurutu, I believe Leto II varies from the path of the hero quest to become something else. He does not seek out the magical beast that guards the treasure, but rather through the use of large amounts of melange, he transcends the typical hero quest, and rather than slaying or conquering the beast, dragon or worm, he becomes it. In one other interesting sense, he not only slays the beast that guards the treasure, the pearl of great prize, he has also become the prize too. The sand trout squirmed on his hand, elongating, stretching. As it moved, he felt a counterpart elongating and stretching of the vision he had chosen, this thread, not that one. He felt the sand trout becoming thin, covering more and more of his hand. No sand trout had ever before encountered a hand such as this one, every cell supersaturated with spice. No other human had ever lived and reasoned in such a condition. The knowledge from those uncounted lifetimes which blended themselves with him provided the certainty through which he chose the precise adjustments, starving off the death from an overdose which would engulf him if he relaxed his watchfulness for only a heartbeat. And at the same time he blended himself with the sand trout, feeding on it, feeding it, learning it. In accepting the golden path fully, that which his father Paul could not do, he also accepts full prescience and the fact that he must lose his humanity. Leto II consumes vast amounts of melange and then allows the sand trout to cover his skin. His apotheosis is an act of drug-induced transcendental symbiosis with the worms of Arrakis, and symbolically, he too will become Shai Halud and Shaitan, both divinity and adversary, to the Fremen and the Imperium. His divinity then is one where he accepts that he must abandon his humanity and become one with the ecological order of Arrakis. As such, his transformation will change Arrakis as well, reminding us of the mythological association with nature and its workings. Leto II's divinity becomes clear, his association in religion made apparent from the future texts that introduce each chapter. There is a psychological and religious continuity of Herbert's ideas from The Dragon in the Sea and Dune, where at one point Leto II is described within a revised OC Bible in a similar vein to the beast from the Book of Revelations. Thou didst divide the sand by thy strength, thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the desert. Yea, I behold thee as a beast coming up from the dunes, thou hast the two horns of the lamb, but thou speakest as the dragon. Revised Orange Catholic Bible Aaron 2, 4. Leto II's transformation is to give purpose to evolution and, therefore, to give purpose to our lives. In removing himself from the human evolutionary path, he has allowed himself to become the beast, the ultimate predator that will crush and threaten mankind in order to facilitate its ability to survive Kralizek. His purpose is to open up the closed systems that humanity, in its evolutionary stagnation, has created through their empires of order. The implication in his transformation is apparent to him, and what takes him further away from humanity allows him to prevent evolutionary sequences from reoccurring. These sequences are seen as the closed systems which mankind has fallen into, and as Leto realises, there can be no truly closed systems in life. Children of Dune ends with Leto II ascending to the Golden Lion Throne, bearing his new skin which is slowly transforming him. Alia is dead, having succumbed to the multitude and committing suicide. The plans to usurp the throne have all failed, and Leto marries his sister Ganema to secure the throne and begin his breeding programme. The next time we see Leto II in God Emperor of Dune, we are witnessing the end of his three and a half thousand year tyranny. 
His resemblance to the young man we knew is completely gone, and he appears as a giant worm, some stunted limbs and his face being all that remains of his human physiology. In transforming himself into the God Emperor, Leto II, like his Aunt Alia, has let himself be taken over to a certain extent by the ancestors of his other memory. But unlike Alia, who loses her ability to control the multitude of voices, he is able to manage and suppress the majority of these personalities by allowing one in particular to come forward. Herbert calls this personality Harum, which represents the transliteration of the Horus name of the Egyptian pharaoh Khufu, also known as Cheops. I'm a community dominated by one who was ancient and surpassingly powerful. He fathered a dynasty which endured for 3000 of our years. His name was Harum, and, until his line trailed out in the congenital weaknesses and superstitions of a descendant, his subjects lived in a rhythmic sublimity. They moved unconsciously with the changes of the seasons, they bred individuals who tended to be short lived, superstitious, and easily led by a god king. Taken as a whole, they were a powerful people. Their survival as a species became habit. In bringing to the fore a personality that has ruled with a tyrannical hand, Leto II is able to draw on those experiences to ensure his peace moves according to plan. His rule is complete and his prescience ensures this ability, creating an awe and devotion in his followers, and making it very difficult for his enemies to act against him, let alone survive. Although Paul represents Herbert's fullest attempt at exploring the disastrous hero and what happens to a society when such an individual is slavishly worshipped, Leto II is the apex of this attitude. Paradoxically, as a protagonist, we are privy to Leto II's actions and thoughts. Most of God Emperor of Dune acts as an insight into an inhuman god who rules mankind with a velvet glove inside a mailed fist. Through the glimpses of Leto II's last vestiges of humanity, we see a very human ruler who acts for the benefit of humanity, despite the appearances of his actions appearing to be incredibly cruel and tyrannical. Frank Herbert's presentation of his belief that heroes are disastrous for society and that superheroes can compound those mistakes to an even greater scale, could be seen ultimately as a failure, depending upon his intent. Herbert, after all, does not like providing solutions for society's problems, but rather likes to present dichotomies to his readers rather than any real answers. Perhaps the paradox he is trying to avoid here is that in presenting the dangers of the hero to society, he himself feared that his readership might place him on a pedestal for doing so. He does succeed in highlighting the dangers of a society slavishly following leaders, and the systems of power they implement around them, religions and governments in particular. As to his heroes and superheroes being dangerous to society, it should be noted that the tyranny of Leto II and the jihad of Paul Muad'i Betrides have both one singular goal, the saving of mankind from annihilation. Their means with which they do so is the hydraulic despotism of their control over Melange and the religious systems built up around their divinity. The reader of the Dune series is aware of this, even though the populations of the Imperium are not. Paul and Leto II in all that they do, regardless of how terrible it may seem, is for the sake of humanity. Paul's failure in the Golden Path is that ultimately he cannot give up his humanity, even though he is willing to give up his life. It is this failure that takes our original hero of the series down the road of an ultimately ineffectual anti-hero. Leto II is able to do both, suffering his four deaths and separating his consciousness to become the worm once again. His sacrifice is heroic, but its result has the appearance of villainy. 
His transformation as he dies lets loose all the symbiotic sand trout from his body, which will return the worms and melange to Arrakis in abundance, bringing about another ecological change. Each worm will contain a pearl of his awareness, his resurrection as the divided god, and the assurance of his continued worship as divinity, tyrant, and devil. His tyranny has resulted in genetic changes to humans through his breeding program, as well as evolving certain technologies to ensure that mankind is capable of surviving Kralizek. Although sceptical of the author's error-filled representation of Dune's extreme environment, Roberts takes note of Frank Herbert's accomplishment of constructing an effective political satire, perhaps not realising that they are both intrinsically linked. Herbert's achievement, in other words, was to render the coming of the Messiah in an accurately observed political context, noting as he did so how close the messianic impulse is to the fascistic, God Emperor of Dune with its powerful central image of the dictator as a monstrous worm, maybe one of the most effective satires on fascism yet written. Having died before completing the final part of the Dune series, readers have had to wait many years to learn of the nature of Kralizek and whether humanity survives the apocalyptic event because of the creation of the Golden Path. In Hunters of Dune and Sandworms of Dune, we see that ultimately mankind does survive because of the Golden Path and the breeding programs of the Bene Gesserit and the Atreides. Humanity returns to its need to use technology against the thinking machines, but as the eventual symbiosis of man and machine, Duncan Idaho merging with an AI consciousness that creates a new evolutionary paradigm. Duncan is primarily reincarnated by the God Emperor for two reasons in particular. His undying devotion and loyalty to the Atreides family, and his rebellious streak. It is the ability to break away from his blind loyalty to House Atreides, which seems almost written into his genetic code, that represents his true triumph as a man becoming independent of his messianic impulse. It is because of this that he becomes the true hero of the Dune series, and the reader must ultimately question this misdirection on the part of the author. Duncan's sacrifice as the hero once again saves humanity, and again this action goes beyond the mere death of an individual. Like Leto II, Idaho is forced to give up his humanity. The example of the extraordinary individual, the hero, in the end saves humanity from extinction and echoes Samuel Butler's philosopher once again. As man and machine must learn to live in symbiosis, we return to the question of considering what if machines were to be regarded as a part of man's own physical nature, being really nothing but extracorporeal limbs. Mankind, it seems, is indeed a machinate animal, and the systems we create can both save us and destroy us. It is breaking out of perceived closed systems, renewing ourselves as a species, that is necessary to ensure we do not lapse into an evolutionary rut. But if it would seem that, as Herbert suggests, we shouldn't follow heroes blindly, then surely the conclusion reached is that even he doesn't truly believe that all heroes are bad for society. Herbert's heroes take extraordinary measures for the survival of humanity, not out of any possible personal gain, but for the need to create a greater good that is unforeseen. In the case of Leto II and Duncan Idaho, they sacrifice everything for the survival of the species and show an understanding of the complexities that motivate the people in the streets. Both of these characters are to an extent followed blindly by the masses, Idaho is followed by the fish speakers because Leto II tells them to, and Leto II is followed because he is the ultimate predator and tyrant, but both are in effect rebels. Their true purpose is to ensure that the masses never again have the need to serve a messiah. The true slavish obedience that Herbert is warning his readers about is focused on Paul Atreides by the Fremen, and it is his heroic actions and subsequent selfish failure to establish the Golden Path that leads to the destruction of the people of Arrakis. As Carlyle points out, no sadder proof can be given by a man of his own littleness 
than disbelief in great men. And truly, the history of the world was the biography of great men.